Good evening and welcome here to 5 by 15. Uh, this has been one hell of a day in British politics and I have to say I couldn't be happier than to be settling down to listen to our two speakers tonight and thank you all everyone for joining us. Great to see so many of you out there. Um, our speakers tonight are really special. We're going to be talking about talking to animals, understanding animal communication and looking at the natural world in ways that feel incredibly important right now. Now, I don't know how many of you happen to see that absolutely extraordinary clip that's on YouTube and that I think has been watched something like 11 million times of a canoe going across a very placid piece of sea off the coast of California and then suddenly a whale comes along and flip, it looks pretty drastic. The person who was canoeing that canoe, uh, along with a friend of his, was the author Tom Mustel. And uh, I'm very happy to say that Tom is there tonight. So one of the very interesting things that I read about when I read Tom's book and was reading about it was that a specialist said that the way that the whale turns in the water indicates that the whale knew exactly what was happening and definitely didn't want to kill Tom and his friend off. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It only takes about 30 seconds and it's quite mind-blowing. Anyway, as a result of that adventure, although he was already interested, Tom wrote a book called How to Speak Whale, which is a fantastic read and out now, and I couldn't recommend it more highly. His book is filled with joy and with grief, and as Tom says about himself, He's a sort of nature war reporter. And of course, in the nature of being a war reporter, not all stories have happy endings. Tom's also a filmmaker who's worked with Greta Thunberg, with David Attenborough and with others. But for tonight, he's, he's a writer and he's a naturalist and he's really good at both. I'm thrilled also to be able to say that he's going to be joined by Lucy uh, Jones, who's the brilliant author of a wonderful book called Losing Eden. Now, we Lucy has been on 5 by 15 a couple of times already, memorably talking to Robin Wall Kimmerer, as well as a wonderful session with Amy Littrop. Both of those are available on Catch Up. Losing Eden is literally about what it, what it sounds on the tin, that we are losing our connection with the natural world. And one of the things that Lucy says is that the hero myth, the drive to seek safety, control and power over the earth that's powered Western capitalism and civilization has gone too far. We've taken too much and set patterns in progress process which are winding up in deep disorder. So what two people more could you want to listen to than Tom and Lucy talking tonight? Format is simple, same as usual. They'll talk for 40 minutes, 45 minutes. In the meantime, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll be putting details of their books in the chat and please get them because they're both really, really worth reading. They'll be available from our bookseller, New and Books or from any good bookstore. So from no further ado from me, I'm now going to hand over to the wonderful Lucy Jones. Lucy. Thank you, Rosie. Hi everyone, hi Tom. Hello, good evening. What um, a pleasure it is to be with you tonight. Um, thank you, Rosie, for that introduction. And hi to everybody um, at home. Um, I love Tom's book. I've got a copy here and almost every page I've kind of turned it down um, because every page has a wow moment of, of finding out something that you didn't know before, which um, just awes you. Um, it's so enjoyable and so entertaining um, and you uncover and explain this revolution in biology to us in such accessible um, prose um, and your prose is so visceral and evocative. Um, I just wanted to read this line where you describe the skin of, of the whale, the filigree of cracks and scars resembling the texture of a cucumber. You really um, bring us into the sea and all the smells and all the senses. It's, it's just wonderful. It's also very funny. Um, 
So I think that we have to start with Prime Suspect, which is the name given to the whale um, that breached on your kayak with your friend. Um, there's so much to talk about, but I think we must we must start there with this experience, um, which you tell in full so so thrillingly and beautifully in your book. Um, but could you could you just tell us a little bit of of what happened and what was it like to have such an unusual and unique death-defying experience? Well, it was very surprising. I think that was the, the first thing. Um, we, in some ways it shouldn't have been. We were whale watching, my friend Charlotte and, and me. We were, we were out kayaking. It was a very calm and placid morning you could see for miles and it was just very almost silent in the water. You could hear the drips from the tips of the kayak as you pulled uh, one oar out of the water and then the other paddle. Um, and we'd had a really nice morning uh, and there'd been lots of whales and we'd managed to stay far away from them and paddled back to shore. Um, and then, yeah, the, it breached onto us. And the, the main, well, it was very simple. I, I, I thought that Charlotte was dead and that I was dying. That was my main thing because she was at the front of the kayak and the whale came up towards us and then down. And it, I'd been in a car crash once and it, there wasn't long enough to, to, to really have, have any fear or any higher thought apart from the whale is coming up and now it's going to land on us and now we're going to die. And then the other feeling was just being underwater. And I've, I've never moved that fast in the water. I love the sea and I, try, I surf and I spend a lot of time in the water. Um, and you know, when you're driving along a road and you go over a bump and your stomach goes up and down and you get that, that, that feeling, I, I never, moved fast enough in the water to have that feeling but we were pulled under really fast and I remember being startled by that sort of sensation and also that I was totally unsure of what orientation I had I I opened my eyes and it was all white and I didn't know which way was up or down and so uh, those were the immediate feelings just a sort of recognition that I was going to die or uh, well, both of us were going to die then a sort of enormous feeling of power um, uh, of something very powerful around us and movement and then and then fear as I thought oh now I could maybe do something about this which way should I swim will I get hit by it if I go the wrong way uh, and then exhilaration when I, I came up through the surface of the water and, and I was alive and I didn't no, nothing seemed obviously broken and then Charlotte was alive and I saw her face and she was smiling and, and it was just relief and then after that, once we got back to shore, reflecting on it, just thinking of that whale just there and how close it had been and, and all as, you know, like those cracks in it, but also the pleats in its throat and the barnacles and everything had been so, the texture had been so vivid because normally you look at whales through the water or flat down from on top, but when they're in the air above you and the sun is shining past them, it's really, well, I mean, it was I mean, it's, I don't think I've ever really got my head around it. Even now I'm trying to explain it to you, but I, I don't think I've really understood it because it was so big and it's so surprising. Um, but mainly I just felt really lucky to not have died and to have got to witness something like that. Because you, you, you've loved, you loved whales before, didn't you? You, have fa you were fascinated with them and you'd, you'd made a film about them before. Can you tell us a bit about your early experiences of what, like, how did you get into whales? When did you fall in love with whales? What was it that as a child perhaps drew you into that, um, to that interest? Well, I mean, I think the only two programs I was ever allowed to watch on TV as a kid were Star Trek and David Attenborough documentaries. And so I, I saw a lot of whales in both. There was whales in Star Trek, the journey, the voyage home, and there was whales in, in planet earth. Um, my wife Annie laughed at me because after this happened uh, she found a childhood album of mine and we'd gone on a holiday to Canada and all of my brother's photos and all the rest of the family's were, uh, sort of keepsakes were family photos and I just filled my bit of it with just postcards of orcas and I remember one of the most crushing disappointments I had as a child um, was we went on a, a family holiday to Wales and the whole I remember being in the car in the drive and thinking when we get to Wales we'll see the whales. And then we got to whales and there weren't any obvious whales or dolphins. And I just remember being so sad about that. Um, and I always had binders with facts about them. And then as a teenager, I volunteered on whale watching boats, making sure tourist boats didn't get too close to the whales and taking photos of their fins. Um, so they've always sort of been there. 
I I don't think I ever really knew why. I I, I mean they're just compelling. Um, um, one of the, I love the fact that you have these, there's the images, if, if people haven't got the book yet, you must all get it, but I love the way that you've kind of threaded images through, which obviously I think speaks to your kind of visual talent as a filmmaker, but one of the, um, one of the images that really kind of brought it home to me that whales are mammals, um, is the, the image of a whale kind of hand, um, okay. I can't find it now, but it really, it really made me realise. Gosh, they really are, they really are mammals. And I wondered if you would just. I'm, I'm sure the audience there might be varied, um, a different spectrum of knowledge about whales. Could you just tell us, kind of, briefly, like what is a whale? What, what mm -hmm. are we talking about when we talk about whale? Well, it's a really good question because they're, really, they're they're quite odd. In the uh, the main trajectory of most life are, are on land was to stay on land. Um, but whales are mammals like us, and so um, they came onto land along with our sort of fishy ancestors. But then, sometime I think about over about fifty million years ago, they started the ancestors of what are now whales started going back into the sea, and at that time, they were hairy, four-legged, kind of dog-like animals, and they had kind of hoovy claws and snouts and whiskers. Um, and, you know, like our ancestor at that time and us now and whales now, they gave birth to live young, which they fed with with lactation. Um, they're warm blooded, so they generate heat to make their body temperature. They have fat, yeah, whiskers and hair. And in fact, whales today still uh, in the uterus sometimes have some hair and still have whiskers as adults. So if you get really close to them, you'll notice they've got these bristles on their snouts. Um, and they they feed from their mother's teats, but underwater you can't really lactate in the same way as you can in air. So the mothers have muscles which jet the milk out at high speed into special grooves on the baby's tongues, which they come up and sort of dock with them with. Um, and then they um, and the milk is incredibly fatty because if you live in the sea, you've got to gain weight really really quickly. So whale milk would make delicious ice cream because it's so full of fat and sugars, so the babies can gain weight really fast. But all that's just a really long winded way of saying that whales are really like us, but unlike us, they've gone back to the oceans um, and uh, evolved a whole host of adaptations to live effectively there, including echolocation, insulation, the ability to hold their breath, soak their tissues full of oxygen. Um, uh, but in and inside their heads, of course, like other mammals, they have very, very large, complex brains. And like other mammals, many other mammals, they're highly, many of them are very social. Um, so does that kind of cover it? Sorry, I get it, so excited. I'll run away and talk about everything, but um, it, I should try and restrain myself. It covers it beautifully. Um, talking about their social behaviour, I just loved, I just loved learning about that and, and how much kind of more we know um, about them. And um, the more we know, the less kind of they seem so different to us. Um, could you tell us a little bit about their social behaviour and their, their, their communication? What, what do we actually know at this point? Well, it, it's changing very rapidly. Um, that's one thing to recognise. And until really the mid 20th century, we hardly knew anything about whales, apart from the tales of whalers um, who knew them by hunting them. Um, but most, mostly we didn't think that they were very complicated or made any sounds. Um, though wh some whalers did report that they seemed to cry out in anguish and that they could hear their calls up the ropes linking the harpoons to the boats. Um, but what we've learned in that really in the last 15 and 20 years has been pretty astonishing. Uh, we've learned that they sing. We've learned that uh, in that there's humpback whales and other species have long performances uh, with musical elements or human-like musical elements in them that are analogous to song like rhyme and rhythm and uh, repeated patterns of verse, chorus, verse, and things like that. Um, they, uh, dolphins, many species of dolphins seem to have what uh, signature whistles, which are analogous to names for themselves that other dolphins will learn around them and use when those dolphins are there. And even if those dolphins are separated for say 15 or 20 years, when reunited, they'll use their signature whistles again in recognition. 
Um, they have, uh, there was a study that came out a few weeks ago with sperm whales that shows that sperm whale cultures and the scientists call them cultures because they teach one another vocally how to survive and they all have very different ways of hunting, navigating uh, and interacting. The different sperm whale cultures, even if they'll live in the same sea, it's almost as if they're acoustically uh, tattooed. They're, they're, they're called acoustic clans. They don't interact with each other. They live differently and they, they speak differently too. They seem to have different repertoires of vocalizations, even different accents. Um, they have many human-like capacities or sort of, sorry, let me rephrase that. They exhibit behaviors that, it, that, that we thought until recently were only human. Uh, famously, there's orcas that seem to mourn their young carrying their dead calves. Uh, for days and days and sometimes weeks around after they've died. Uh, humpback whales will interfere uh, and exhibit altruism. They will stop other killer whales from hunting humpback whales, but not just other humpback whales. They'll interfere when, humpback uh, when orcas are hunting gray whales, um, seals, porpoises, sea lions. They'll come up and lift up porpoises and sea lions on top of them to keep them away from the killer whales that are trying to attack them. And I even met a woman who claimed that a humpback whale had shielded her from a tiger shark. Um, so that's an altruistic behavior. Um, the interspecific, which is very uh, peculiar, they also do some pretty unpleasant things by human standards and by any standard, really. They, some dolphins are rapists. Um, some commit, uh, they kill their young, there's infanticide. Um, uh, and, and some seem to kill for no reason that we can understand. So they exhibit a sort of full gamut of you know, what we would call sort of like positive and negative behaviors in, pe in people, um, which I think speaks to their complexity really. And that the difference but that there'll be different personalities within their social groups, different behaviors within the species and radically different ways of living between species. Um, and really it doesn't, not a week goes by really without a new paper coming out, finding out some new facet of their social or behavioral or anatomical lives. And that's because we've just been unable to see them for most of the time that we've known they're there. Fascinating. Um, and I think some of my favourite stories in the book are the interactions between whales and the species Homo, homo sapiens. Um, the inter, uh, interspecies um, uh, yeah, interactions and relationships that have happened. Can you tell us a little bit about um, those examples of um, symbiosis, like what were your favorite ones of, of human whale kind of seeming to cooperate and, and um, bond in some way? Well, there's stories of cetaceans and people interacting that go back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, and there are many stories uh, running through history anecdotally um, and uh, to modern times of dolphins coming to the aid of people who are drowning and things like that. Um, I mean, my the reason for it being interested in uh, cetaceans kind of interacting with humans is that if you'd like to speak to another species you really want to try and find another species that might be interested in you and most and other animals will move away when a human is around and act very differently and whales are a bit peculiar or some species of whales like grey whales mothers will bring their calves to boats in Baja California and the calves will open their mouths and tourists will rub their tongues and look at them and it seems like the mothers are bringing their offspring to look at the people or the boats and when I've filmed humpbacks often I've been what's called mugged by friendly whales which are humpbacks that will seem to seek out interactions with humans they stick their heads out of the water which is called spy hopping and they'll look at you as they're bobbing above the water from one eye then the other and then they'll go under the boat and roll around so they're very inquisitive which which is a good start if you want to speak to another species the story that i think is the most astonishing is in eden australia there is uh, about four or five generations of whalers uh teamed up with a pod of orcas of killer whales that lived on the coast of eden this is in uh southeastern australia um and they're bigger whales like baleen whales migrate from the colder waters to the warmer waters with their young and the killer whales wait in uh, lion wait for them to try and hunt them and what happened there was that the killer whales would alert the whalers in their row in their rowing boats to the presence of the migratory whales uh, for instance like some would come there was a whale called old tom and he'd come out and he'd slap his tail fin 
um, near the house, uh, near the estuary where the whalers lived. And they'd rush down sometimes in the night, uh, woken from their sleep, and they'd paddle out. Some of the, uh, of the killer whale pod would be waiting offshore, keeping the prey whales trapped. And then the whale that had brought the humans would take them out and the humans would harpoon the prey whales. Sometimes the killer whales would grab the uh, ropes from the harpoons in their teeth. And there's the skeleton, the skull of one of them in the museum there with, with the teeth worn down from hauling alongside the people. Um, and then once the whale was killed, the whalers would uh, leave it and leave the tongue of the whale for the orcas who'd eat it. And then they'd take the rest of the body and render it down for blubber and other uses. And that was known as the law of the tongue. It was like a deal between the humans and the killer whales there. And that was uh, photographed many times and painted and there are eyewitness accounts. And there's, uh, I've watched loads of video testimony of people who were born in the early part of the 20th century who saw it themselves. Um, and there were very sad stories like one of the whalers drowned and his body wasn't found for days but one of the killer whales seemed to be hovering around a certain part of the bay. And when they paddled out, they found the body of the whaler was underneath the killer whale and he was standing guard over the body of the human. Um, and that's an extraordinary story, which sadly came to an end when those killer whales disappeared and were probably thought to have been killed off by other whalers who didn't realize that they had a, a, a relationship with the humans there. But uh, yeah, what a story, that's right? Astonishing. Um, and all, and Kind of all these stories add up to this picture and you know your desire which is as has led to you raising the book of wanting to know what they're saying wanting to know more about what they're thinking and 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 it and it's technology isn't it it's machine learning it's ai um which is which will take us closer to to perhaps one day um being able to to listen um i was kind of before before i read your book I guess I'm a bit of a kind of, and I love parts of technology, but you know, there's parts of it that I don't like. It's, I'm the same with anyone. But you, you, the way you write about technology is really interesting. I think really refreshing. You kind of, um, you show that it's really just like books, or um, you know, it's 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 part of our ev evolution. Um, and it seems that the people who are driving this kind of technological revolution in biology um, are doing good things and and there's a lot of hope there and it, it seems to center a lot on this company c-e-t-e-i is that right Did you say yeah like projects that? project seti yes project seti could you tell us a little bit about kind of where we're at at the kind of cu cutting edge um of kind of human whale communication what are your hopes um could we really be speaking to whales in the next kind of few years where are we at with that well, that's a it's a long question to answer and I think I mean in terms of optimistic relationships with technology I mean I like most people probably am pretty addicted to my phone and pretty unhappy about that situation and I see that as a conservation biologist I don't think that we use many technologies to connect us with the natural world or to benefit the natural world and its inhabitants. Um, I guess the the really interesting part of this, this story for me was, was in finding these places where tech or some uses of tech can reconnect us to nature. I mean, for me, I, I use plant uh, uh, ID apps on my phone, which in lockdown, I learned all the names of the trees in my local park. I didn't help have a helpful older person who knew them to teach them to me. And it doesn't mean I walk around the, the park on my phone looking, it's taught me, I'm done, now I, now I know. Um, and, uh, so that so I feel like that would that things like that are really helpful, you know, uh, helping you see something that you might miss or understand something. Um, I mean, my route into all of this was when the whale breached onto Charlotte and myself. Um, afterwards, because somebody filmed it and it went viral, I was very interested in that. That what how, was an anecdote suddenly became a data point because we all carry phones around with us, so somebody could film it, so people believed. That this thing might happen and then a scientist analyzed the video and and as Rosie said they said they, they showed how the whale had turned away in mid-flight so there was a behavioral analysis caused by a happenstance human with a biological recording device a cell phone in their pocket and then another scientist analyzed the whale uh the, the pattern on its tail fluke 
and used artificial intelligence to figure out who the whale was, who its mother was, where it was born, and link uh, that sighting to, a, to their database of what is now hundreds and hundreds of thousands of whale sightings. Um, and that's all built by citizens, like normal people going out whale watching, taking photos, uploading their photos to databases, and then this huge amount of whale data, uh, which no human could ever comb through, is now being combed through by artificial intelligence algorithms that are trained to pick out patterns, um, ones that we would see but don't have the time to go through all of that information and to find patterns that we'd miss. So I found that like super interesting. As, as a biologist, I was used to just going out looking for things like I worked in, an, in a tropical forest trying to find rare birds and it took ages you had to like walk out you had to sit down you had to not be ill you had to it had to not be raining um you had to listen out for the bird did you see it okay write it in your log book go home tell your colleagues if you'd seen it but I visited a tropical forest in Hawaii with endangered birds where the entire forest was rigged with microphones constantly recording 24 hours a day and, and algorithms listening through all those recordings to notice where birds were singing. And that's the same with whales in the sea. There's robots going through the sea, listening all the time for them as the seabed is rigged. So, uh, which takes us into how you might speak whale. So we have all of this information, which we could never get before because we have machines that can go into the ocean to places we can't go. And we've got uh, recording devices that can, uh, like sense things that we can't sense. A lot of whale communications are below or above human hearing. Uh, and we can't really hear well underwater anyway. Um, and then all of this information is so overwhelming for us, like no human could look through it in a lifetime. But it's really, really helpful if you want to use what's called deep learning uh, neural networks uh, of the same kind that are behind things like Google Translate. Google Translate doesn't work by being taught the difference between French and Swahili. It's not given a bilingual dictionary. What it does is it takes a huge amount of data. Uh, it can be words or spoken language. And then it makes a huge uh, kind of galaxy cloud of all the relationships between the words. And it finds patterns between all the words with this huge amount of data that we don't actually know about. And it fits the sort of pattern cloud of English up against the pattern cloud of Swahili and find, and it, this is one of the great discoveries of the last few years, is that, that there seem to be common patterns across all human languages. Um, so that you can go to the, set, to the same word that has the same relationships in English and find whatever the word is that means that in Swahili. It doesn't mean that's gonna work with, with whales. In fact, if it doesn't work with whales, that's also gonna be really interesting because what representation of their world are they uh, making with their sounds? But yeah, right now, right now, the lead of this project, David Gruber, emailed me this week. Um, their, their listening stations have survived the first tropical cyclone. So they've got their, no, not cyclone, it's the Caribbean, the big, their first hurricane. Um, they've rigged the ocean with listening devices floating on the surface and down every 100 meters. Uh, and they've got soft robotics fish that are swimming around with recording devices. They've got recording devices placed on the backs of the resident sperm whales. They've got drones flying overhead. So in this kind of auditory panopticon where the sperm whales there live, and they've been studied for 20 years, they know all the relationships between the whales. They're gonna record the biggest animal data set of all time. And then they, that will have enough, what they call um, big animal data to go into their big animal data machine learning pipeline, which is it's just a complicated way of saying the pattern finding tools that we've developed for finding patterns in human communication, let's see what patterns they find in animal communications. Um, and they'll do things like by watching baby sperm whales learning to talk, they will then start to form like the linguists on their teams and the, uh, uh, will start to form theories about how sperm whale speak works. And then they can test them by saying, well, if this theory is correct, what did the whale say next and who answered? And then it, they can look at the, all the recordings and they want to speak to them by 2026. And this is a really serious team of people who've got an incredible track record. And they're some of the biggest hitters in machine learning, remote robotics, animal behavior. Um, and yeah, they really mean business. It's going well so far. And I mean, it sounds kind of a bit mad, doesn't it? But I, 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 at the end, it's taken me four and a half years to research this. And, and I think it's, it's extremely exciting. You must be holding your breath for what we're going to find out in a few years. Um, you, as, as Rosie said, um, you, you're a you're a nature war reporter, and, and you, you're also 
conservationist, activist, you have your um, brilliant climate podcast, and you've made films with Greta. Um, I was thinking about um, what, what can we learn from listening to whales um, that might help us today? Or how, how can this um, can revolution in science um, speak to the crisis that we're in today? Well, I think it's about connection. I mean, what Greta's been talking about very recently is that I made a film with her about how our lack of connection to the natural world is is one of the main drivers of many of the problems we have, the food systems we have, our, our use of land, our understanding of diseases and what is natural and unnatural have, have got us into real trouble. And as a, the reason I got into wildlife filmmaking was as a conservationist, I recognized that making films about the natural world made people, gave people an opportunity to relate to animals and living systems that they wouldn't encounter in their lives, care about them and want to do things about them. And all the uh, scientists on these projects, and there are a number of these projects trying, uh, trying to sort of decode animal communications, their motivation is that when we see patterns in other species that make us think of ourselves and give us fellow feeling, it motivates us to make decisions and change our lives in a way that benefits those other species that we care about, that we care more about. So if we could understand what other animals are saying, or if we could understand that they had language like communications and get closer to that, the hope is that that means we would stop, that we would take more care to look after those other species and take, uh, make better decisions for them. That's one part of it. So there's the conservation benefit. Um, and I think also, I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, one of the things that somebody on the, one of the teams said was like, can you imagine how hard it would be to eat meat if you could have subtitles at abattoirs? You know, like if you knew what um, an animal was, was calling out when it was in distress if that represented something that we could identify with. Um, and that there's this philosophical element to it, which is really, really powerful too. You know, when we first got the pale blue dot photo of the Voyager space probe, looking back at Earth as it left our solar system, we understood how fragile and tiny and vulnerable and special the planet is. And I think that was a really important moment for the environmental movement to, to not feel so special as individual, like as a human species and understand that we're surrounded by communities and cultures of communicating uh, sentient creatures that might be the only other communicating sentient creatures that we could ever encounter in the universe. Uh, I think is it would be a kind of reality check and a value check and maybe a bit of relief. I, I feel like maybe there's quite a lot of weight on you when you think, oh, we're the only thinkers, we're special, we need to get off the planet. All these narratives about humans needing to like get to Mars to save our specialness. It's, it feels to me to be missing the point. Like we know that in the sea, like, like sperm whales have the biggest brains of any animal they've ever lived. Like what are those brains thinking? We know that they have like incredibly complex vocal communications. What are they saying? Could we make contact with another mind? I think of like, the Neanderthals, I think of the other hominins and other human-like species that existed. I feel really lonely that we don't get to speak to something that's like us living on earth, but not like us. You know, what, what would they think about us? What could they teach us about us um, by the things that we don't have in common and the things we do? I mean, these, these are huge questions and it's so exciting. And they were always just children's questions and silly questions, uh, but now they feel more technical. Like, it's interesting you use the word lonely um when you were talking um to us and telling us about whales kind of being in the sea coming out of the sea and going back in the sea kind of made me think maybe the allure of whales for us human animals is you know they left why did they leave hmm. us huh. um also the the word silly you use um is is interesting i think and you write really well about um the kind of legacy of of descartes and this kind of set this human exceptionalism which is so it's so kind of um so hard to to evolve out of and so hard to shed it's so kind of underpinning our, our thinking and culture although um you know everything in your book kind of speaks to the to you know kind of dismantling this human exceptionalism um 
I I wanted to ask you about so you're you've had this career as a filmmaker and and now you're writing what what what's the how is the form different what's it like what's there been the difference for you kind of creatively what was it like to tell this story through words well I don't think I could have told it as a film I think it's so nice of you to say that because I I it's a big new thing for me and I think when I started making television documentaries in 2006 I you could name documentary makers you know everybody I knew going into the business, the filmmakers that I found really impressive and I wanted to emulate. And gradually natural history films have become less authored perspectives on nature and they've become more mass entertainment products and being within that industry. And I think you kind of sense this and perhaps many of the people here might have experienced this. You watch the films and they're spectacular and beautiful but perhaps you're not surprised and perhaps you're not given a different person's perspective who's deciding what images to show you. And that, that feeling of authorship had kind of drained away. And, it, and that felt, felt like both creatively quite sad because you want to be able to represent something that's true to you and have that link with your audience. Um, and also a bit sad because it meant that we're telling such bland and samey stories of nature. And if you have to represent everything, you've got to show everything as you do with film uh, or often with film. Um, how do you make a book that's about the ideas of language and things that might not happen yet? And especially AI. I mean, how do you represent AI? How do you make a film of that? It's just like, do you do like matrix like numbers down the screen? So I don't know if you even could make a film of it, but the process for me has been wonderful because I, it's so intimate writing um, and it was scary. Um, because if I was really worried, like, if you make a bland film, you can hide it by putting some slow mo, slow motion in it, some, buy some nice music, get, change the colours so they look better, and buy some other shots, and you can kind of hide, and you can hide because it's a team endeavour, um, but you can't just, if you've written a bland book, you can't just change the font and hope no one notices. So I felt very vulnerable and exposed, um, and but also I felt like that was very thrilling. And, he, and also in the process of writing it, like for me, the best part of filmmaking is when, you, when you've got an idea and you go to meet the scientists and you go and spend time in the wild places and you haven't got any kit and you're just experiencing it and taking it in and thinking, what could this be? Um, and then if you suddenly turn up with like three cameras and five people and, lo and you're asking, oh, can I charge my thing over here? Oh, sorry, can you walk backwards and forwards five times? All that intimacy, it dissipates and people are suddenly worried if you're filming people, if their hair looks okay, or you know, if they're, being, if they're feeling a bit grumpy and, and writing a book, you can just, you're just, yeah, it's this wonderful passport with popular science, or I guess like, you know, nonfiction in general is you, you can just ask people to come into their lives and then you just spend time with them. And my main memory of writing this book is time spent with other people and I wasn't having to put them out. It was all in their own terms. And then my only role was really to help the reader to experience what it was like to be in that position and to meet them and to describe it. And that was great. I really liked it. Um, and which is why it's so encouraging for you being nice about it because I'd like to do it again. Uh, I feel like I, the films are nice too. I'm also, I, I don't know, I, I love using lenses. I'm sort of, you know, it's lovely to play with a view and, and share it directly. You bastard, you're good at both. <laughs> you're brilliant well, Maybe jack both. of all trades, master of none. That's that's <laughs> the, the phrase that rings in my head. But uh... <laughs> No, and, and your book is far from bland. It's, it's, it's incredibly thrilling. Um, I'm realizing that we've got a lot of questions coming in and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to um, answer their questions, um, have their questions answered, but I have a couple more. Um, how has, you said, you said it was four and a half years, your kind of explore, what, exploration, and you, you've obviously had this kind of quite um, long career and, you know, you studied um, natural sciences or biology. Yeah, um, natural sciences, and, yeah. And then, and then you've, wor you've worked in this area, you know, um, you know, you know a lot about um, the world, um, but how has this particular exploration and, and inquiry changed your relationship with the earth, with the living world, um, 
and also how has it changed your kind of thinking about the the crisis that we're we're currently facing well i mean my biological education was one of bodies so i went to cambridge and i was taught you know you you would you were confront you were given like a whole bunch of different preserved specimens and firstly you had to arrange them into the tree of life and figure out the relationships between the bodies and the museums were all skeletons you know this is the skeleton of an asiatic you know this and this is the skeleton of like a nematode worm and 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 you oh there's worms that have skeletons but you know you you had to sort of figure out how bodies related and in these kind of and that was because we could only really capture bodies before and now we have the wildlife filmmaking example of it the ability to capture what bodies do and we have this and also we live in this age of information where we think about information a lot more and communication. We think about the value of that. We think about the power of that. Um, and so I guess what I've been going through in the process of this is really thinking about, well, what will a natural history museum look like in 20 years? Will it be just loads of videos of swarm dynamics? Will you be able to experience the information flow? Because I feel personally, I'm less interested in bodies and more interested in personalities and how those bodies interact and symbioses and uh, mutualisms and communications. And so I go to the local park and I don't, I, I still appreciate the glossiness of the feathers of the starlings. But I'm also fascinated about why they're choosing that bit of the park and what they're chattering about together. And I'm kind of in my mind, there's sort of information flowing between them that perhaps is, you know, perhaps we might be able to have a window into it. So that's one thing. I've sort of gone from bodies to behaviors. Um, and in terms of my kind of con conservation or, or like e eco feelings, I just, I'm really, I guess, when I learned about how many whales had died, I don't know, like, if you were surprised reading this in the book, I was surprised researching it, like, three million whales died, and most of them very recently, I thought most whaling was like Moby Dick era, but it wasn't, it was mid 20th century, including into our lifetime, in, like, when I was born in the 80s, there was still a lot of whales being slaughtered, and 99.9% .9 of blue whale population, some blue whale populations were slaughtered, and when you understand that these animals have cultures and you think of how long, you know, these animals have been talking in the sea for maybe 30, 40 million years. You know, that's way longer than we've been talking and using our vocal anatomy to, to communicate on land. So what culture was lost in that? So, I, I, so I, I, as a conservationist, I now think, you know, we just measure animals, how many elephants are left? How many giraffes are left? Oh, okay, brilliant. It got down to 10, but now there's a thousand. It's okay. And now I think more, what cultures are we losing? What, what cannot be rebuilt despite the numbers of bodies? Um, and that is a scary, uh, unsettling thought. Um, one of the currents I, I, I sense through the book and was, is just awe. We have such a good way of communicating awe and or just seems um, kind of so present in, in your writing. And I, I wondered kind of where you're finding or now. Well, I mean, like most of us, <laughs> it's been a, the last few years have been slightly or starved because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but actually I'm, uh, my our daughter Stella was born last January and watching a human give birth to a baby and then watching that baby metamorphosize through all sorts of different ways of being and sensing and thinking and you're forced you know or I I was forced as a preoccupied adult person you know distracted by phones thinking about work and jobs and mortgages and things you kind of can't and that has been such an awe lifeline for me. Stella has. She, at first, just by her, you know, her breathing and the sounds she made and her, the absurdity of her and the, the way that watching a birth makes you just totally understand that we're animals and that so much of what we dress ourselves up in is just artifice. And, and then watching her personality emerge and her interests come out and 
in, in a way I've been sort of awestruck by humdrum things or things I'd allowed to become humdrum like leaves or a tap. Like she's really into taps when I turn the tap on and off. Of course, it's incredible. Be water is so beautiful in the way it moves and how it changes when you put your hand into it and it runs along the underside of it and you get close to it and you can taste it. Like we go and look at the fish pond. And so she's like a, a she's been very helpful for me in uh, in kind of finding awe in, in places I would have uh, discounted. And it doesn't have to be just a, a giant whale jumping on you because I, I don't think I'm ever going to, have any anything like that I hope I never have anything like that happen again um uh and in a way I think that's been a much more valuable or experience um for me having her that's beautiful um just one more question from me and it, you, it made me think of it when you talked about you know birth kind of um killing off any illusions that we're not animals and you quote the philosopher Melanie Challenger in your book um um saying you know we're we're the we're the animals who've forgotten that we're animals um so my final question to you before we go to others are how do we remember we're animals i don't know it's so hard because i we, we seem to construct a world it's almost like the purpose is to pretend that we're not you know we we fear death and we avoid looking at it apart from in sort of glamorized and weird instances um that's a way I think I think actually probably my trade is partly to blame nature storytelling with these kind of weird perfect stories of individual animals like what if a nature film started halfway through and then the protagonist died rotted and then a bunch of you know daffodils grew out of where they their corpse had disintegrated I think that would that would help us remember reflect on our own lives and things we've seen and and feel connected. I think, yeah, I think just in in touch and, um, oh, I don't know. You know what? I'm absolutely stumped because I, I kind of flip between in my own head remembering and then forgetting, and remembering and forgetting. And I and it's like when I go out, and, I, and often it won't be in the natural world that I'll remember that I'm an animal or around another animal. Um, I. But I, I think I'm so in, encultured with this idea, and I think we are, are also encultured with this idea that we aren't animals. That it, that it's it's almost it, a really interesting thing. Actually, here's here's a story that's really interesting. Is that it didn't go into the book, but there's a woman called Sue Savage Rumbau, and she did a lot of the really important experiments. She had a bonobo called Kanzi, who she taught how to communicate using a book of lexigrams, which are kind of pictures that represent, that represent symbols that had meaning. And Kanzi the bonobo and her would talk and they, they lived like uh, Kanzi's whole uh, life together until recently. And I asked Sue what she thought about the experiments with, oh, sorry, about the studies on the whales and speaking to whales. And she said that she reckoned that people were really okay we're learning how to speak whale because we can other whales. They're so different from us. They don't look like us. We're cool with them being able to talk because they're kind of like aliens. But the reason that her primate studies hadn't had loads of financial support and had been attacked so roundly, and so many of these studies have been attacked, was that we're so much more squeamish about our nearest relatives being able to talk or communicate or being really close to us. That freaks us out. So I thought that was interesting. Um, that's not an answer to your question, though. Um, it reminds me of, I think you say in, in the book, you know, do we actually want to hear what they have to say? Because hmm. they're probably not going to be particularly um, yeah. complimentary about. Um, no. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a cheeky part of me that like I was in, I, I was just watching some owners taking their dogs for a walk. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of dogs out there and a lot of owners. And I would say 100 percent of the owners or near enough are convinced their dog loves them. Is that necessarily true? Are the owners of the dogs that, you know, what if your dog preferred your next door neighbor? Would you want to pick up its poo every day as much? You know, but then that would be a more real relationship. I don't know, maybe we prefer the, the, the projection. Um, so interesting. Right, we've got to get onto questions because there's quite a lot um, to get through. Um, a wonderful book full of learning and as gripping as a thriller. You mentioned many incidents of whales making dramatic efforts to communicate with us. What do you think they most want us to hear or understand? 
I think if I was a whale, I would find it very confusing the amount of noise that I have to navigate. I think that would be one thing. I think when the pandemic happened, um, ocean traffic dropped and the, the seas got quieter and scientists reported that whales were communicating differently. They seem to be using more sophisticated, complex, longer uh, communications. And in the way that if you were in like a loud pub, you might shout, hey, you over here. Whereas if you're in a quiet pub, you might have a more nuanced uh, conversation that took advantage of your full range of, of communication ability. Um, they really need sound for everything from navigating to interacting with one another uh, to feeling well. And we're flooding their world in many ways unnecessarily with it. I think, I think that would be the first thing because like a, bow, a bowhead whale, right, can live for over 200 years. So that's from before the invention of the motorboat, like vastly before. So in one whale lifetime, the seeds have gone from being silent apart from noises of like volcanoes and wind and rain and other animals to just this. I mean, if you're if you put I, I put loads of recording devices in the sea and it, it, it's mad how much anthropogenic noise there is. And that's all in one whale lifetime. How do you get used to that? Um, so I think they probably before anything want us to just be a bit quieter. Um, but yeah. Thank you also for that question. That's really nice. Um, <clears throat> apologies for the fireworks. I hope people can't hear them. Um, okay, another question. What would be the biggest lesson from your whale observation? Well, I think the, the, the thing that struck me, there's a guy called Ari Friedlander and he puts remote, he puts on little suction devices, he puts re recording devices in the backs of, of whales. So as they swim around, you can see things from their perspective. And he just said that every time you have a look from their perspective, your assumptions about their lives change. And I think it's it's a simple uh, thing, but they are just so, there's 90 odd species. All those species are split into different populations. They are so nuanced and complicated. We just should really avoid any generalizations or assumptions about them. And that goes in, in all directions, you know, from assuming that they are human-like and have incredible capacities to writing them off. I think that, We've just killed off so many of the big animals on land that we would have had a chance to interact with, but in the sea, they still persist. Um, and I, I, I love the thing that Roger Payne said that he said, the guy discovered whale song that because whales are so cosmopolitan, they live, they swim in all the seas uh, and humpback whale song is a cultural product. And the, the whale, humpback whale song, and it's been around for you know millions of years potentially is the most distributed cultural product of all time. Like, just, just as, a, as something to like get our human lives and ref into perspective, you know, it, it's only a few odd tens of thousands of years that we've been out spouting cultural products everywhere. So, and maybe we won't be allowed around for long. Like in, I, I think they, they give us perspective um, with their diversity. Um, okay. Why can we attribute ideas of pain and unhappiness to our dogs, but take no notice of say pigs? How do we extend that compassion? Well, it's a mixed bag because I guess some people can and some can't. And then I get, you've got people like me who can and can't at different times. And I seem like sometimes I've been carnivorous and sometimes I've been non-carnivorous. And I seem, I've been puzzled in, I'm very puzzled by this, thinking about my own response to it with everything I know. And I think a lot of it is cultural and is based on what other humans are doing around you. I think it's very hard to go against the flow. I think we're highly attuned to um, what our peers are doing and mockery and shame. Um, and so we have logical parts of our brains that allow us to notice um, and be upset by uh, injustice and unfairness and suffering that's caused by us. But then we have other parts that prioritize ourselves and the views other people have of us and I think it's such a messy situation I mean I think if you had a pet pig rather than a pet dog you'd feel exactly the same I think part of it is connection and how close you are in the same way that we tend to care more about other people who are near us than further away um, uh, so maybe it's it's something to do with human nature that w there's like a flaw or like maybe a flaw is too strong a word but we we can't we can't limitlessly and um connect but it's worth a try <laughs> um okay do you think all 
other animals have a language? N no, and I would be really hesitant to even say that any other animals have a language because language is this awful, tiresome battleground of linguists who mainly study humans and have strong feelings about animals. And I just want to avoid it personally. I feel like um, uh, they might have, if, 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 the, if by language the question meant communication systems capable of transmitting meaningful information about beliefs, desires, experiences, uh, and descriptions, um, I think it would be very surprising if cetaceans didn't, because they they have all of they have incredible sound producing anatomy. They they put loads of investment. They've got amazing ears, so they can hear all these sounds. Like the first third of a sperm whale's, the whole first third of a sperm whale's body is just for making sound, and that's for navigating and communicating. Um, and I've seen their brains. I've been watching them have their brains scanned, and they have these huge parts of their cortexes that are, that are devoted to processing auditory information. And um, so, why would they make all these complicated sounds? And why would they think about all these complicated sounds and live in social groups, some of them, and use those sounds to coordinate these lives if those sounds didn't transmit something? And then in experiments with like captive dolphins, they've been able to learn how to combine new novel signals to make new words. You know, there's evidence that they've got names and names for their social groups. Um, whether it will qualify as whatever the latest version of what language is, I, I don't I don't know. I think it will probably be like other parts of biology where we had like a sort of help, a sort of handy dichotomy of like, not if you don't have it or you do have it, and if you don't, you're not us. And if you do, you're us. And that's just fragmenting into like, oh, we have different facets of it and other species are better at different bits of them. I reckon some parts of their communications will be superior to ours. Um, uh, maybe they'll have, I mean, there's really fun philosophical, philosophical things like what would be the whale word for wet <laughs> or dry? You know, we know that, but because we get wet and dry, but they don't tend to dry out very much. They're mainly wet. Um, sorry, that is such a tangent to your question. Um, um, that's fascinating we are I'm afraid we are running out of time and I think it would be really thrilling Tom for you to read just a little bit from the book if you would if you would read us your final paragraph I think that would be a really good um, paragraph to end on um, sorry we didn't get to all the questions uh, and yeah I feel really bad about that I'm sorry I just I, I'm very I'm very long-winded in my question answering um Maybe if, if you tweet any, if you tweet me at Tom Mustill, any of the questions that you didn't get answered, I will answer them. Um, Great. You've packed um, so much in. My mind is blown. Um, uh, yes. Uh, read us out if you will. OK, so this is this is the last paragraph of the book. Actually, I think, can I read the last three paragraphs? Or is that is that cheeky? Yeah, of course. OK. Cheeky. I do not watch the sea like I used to before I set out on the journey of this book. Before, I would just take in the view. Now, however, my eyes skip around it, scrutinizing the shape of spray, a broken wave where there's no rock or wind. A flash on the horizon suddenly reveals itself to be the glint of a fin catching the sun. Every stirring of the surface interrogated in the hope that there is a, the clue to a whale underneath. One afternoon I was looking at the sea, my wife Annie, six months pregnant, beside me with our daughter, still for now an aquatic being in her womb, yet to meet the air. I scanned the waves, reassuring myself there were no hidden cetaceans. And then I thought, what if there were none at all? What if every splash everywhere was just a splash, if no more fins broke the surface? My stomach turned over on itself. They face a troubled future. Some species are going extinct right now. I want my daughter to live in a world where these creatures thrive across the seas in all their forms, where their cultures evolve and shift and mingle and their strange voices fill the depths. I want this world for them, but also for her, for what she might gain from their wild influence, from the things we are on the cusp of knowing about them. My daughter will surely grow and I will surely age. And whether it is from another leaping whale falling on me or I trip on the stairs, I will die. And she will have to learn what it means to lose something forever. This is inevitable. 
but there are losses we do not have to learn to accept, which we can choose to stop. The fates of the whales and dolphins are in human hands, and this loss is one I do not want for her. I hope that when she looks at the sea, an aged woman, she will catch a glimpse of a leaping spinner dolphin or humpback whale, and perhaps when she sticks her head beneath the waves and hears their whistles and songs as I did, they will mean something to her. And perhaps, just perhaps, she will be able to answer back. I am here, she would say. You are here, and I am here. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful. I'll hand over to Rosie. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. That was really lovely. And thank you so much for reading those last few paragraphs of the book. They're extremely powerful. And as someone who's just had grandchildren, I absolutely and totally um, get what you're saying and the idea that in X years time, someone might be able to communicate with them, but mostly that, that we save them and that we look after the planet. So thank you so very much, both of you, to Tom and to Lucy. And as I said, details of their books are, are in the chat. Please get out and buy them. You will not be disappointed. And thank you all very, very much for joining us. And we'll be back again a week tomorrow with the wonderful Abby Morgan talking about Hamwa with David Nichols. Uh, it's going to be a winner, so please tune in. And in the meantime, thank you to our speakers very, very much and to all of you who joined us. Good night and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>